In this video, I'm going to take on a really big question uh, that came from the last video. Uh, what is awareness? And I'm going to handle it in the way I typically handle things. I'm going to tell you what it isn't, and I'll give you an exercise because ultimately it's upon you to figure this out on your own. But we could say at the beginning that awareness is not what we think it is. Thinking is uh, illusion. Thinking is limitation. Thinking is it's the clouds that get between us and the sun. So the sun is always shining, but the clouds can make it seem like it's a uh, uh, rainy day, and it really isn't. And so one of our tasks is to get beyond these limitations. And uh, to get beyond these limitations is very similar to the last video when I was talking about the I thought. And when the I thought expands beyond the limitations of thinking, it becomes the multiplicity. And that is what awareness is. But let's back it up a little bit. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, some findings in psychology. So let's go to the 50s. There's a huge debate you know, about awareness um, in, um, in the 50s. Are we, are, can we only pay attention to one thing at a time, or can we pay attention to a multiplicity? And the first research looked like it was very similar to thinking. In the same way that we can only think one thought at a time, we can only pay attention to one thing at a time. And you've probably had this experience that backs this up. If you've ever been talking to someone, so that's one conversation, but then you went off into a daydream, you found it impossible to daydream and pay attention to the conversation. And maybe you even got busted. I get busted on this occasionally where someone says, you know, they just look at you and they're, well, what was I just saying? Because you weren't paying attention. And you're met with this absolute blankness and you have no clue. And you think, well, should I make something up or just come clean? But the truth is, from your perspective at that moment, it appears as though you you were only able to process one thing at a time. And because you were daydreaming, you couldn't process the conversation. And so it was a uh, total blank to you. Then other research came along. Call, uh, it's studying what's called the party effect. This is very interesting. And maybe you had this experience too, where you're at a party and you're talking to one person. So you're limiting your conversation to one and yet someone says something interesting in the back of the room. Maybe it's your name, maybe it's a topic that you're, is, you're fascinated with or something. And all of a sudden you notice it. Well, that's a paradox because if you were not paying attention to it, how did you notice that it was important? So that shows really strong evidence that we actually are paying attention to everything around us all at once simultaneously. But there's some kind of filter, and this is the thinking process. This is the one thing at a time that so many of us are identified with that we're missing out on the multiplicity. And of course, psychology would say, well, we're just unconscious of these processes until they make it into consciousness. But as I said in so many videos, and it's really a, becoming a main theme of my work, is that what people call the unconscious is typically uh, what is beyond thinking. And so thinking and consciousness have become so confused in our culture that for us to think is to become conscious. And anytime something is outside uh, thinking, we simply attribute it as uh, we assume it's unconscious. But the major evolution that is, uh, in, in, that's on our path right now is to become aware that simply because we're not thinking about something doesn't mean that we're not aware that that system is not aware and eventually we'll figure out that we are aware of the multiplicity we just don't think we are i'll consider the language centers so much of this is tied in with uh, the, the voice in the head and it's not a coincidence that when you examine the voice in the head it has the exact same pace as when we talk it really is like the mirror image of language uh, so why is it that we only think as fast as we can talk. Well, that's because the two are two sides of the exact same coin. But that doesn't mean that there are not other areas of the brain that are not aware and are not processing the environment and the world around them. The problem is these other centers don't have access to language. And in the neural court, uh, basically when you go on the stand, if you can't speak, we don't give you any credibility. But we're slowly coming around on this, and I think neuroscience is starting to realize uh, in an in interesting way that just because you don't 
have access to language does not mean you are unconscious. And we see this with animal research, but we're also seeing it with other. So if I do yoga, would you, would you call yoga unconscious? Probably not. It's a very aware state. It's just you're not using language. So how do we show this? How do we show that there are parts of us that are aware, but when we try to judge whether or not we are aware of them, we're using, we're limiting with the, the clouds in front of the sun. That's the thinking mind. And we're uh, very, we're using a really biased, limited, illusory, Maya-like uh, system to evaluate the whole process. So, so they don't get to take the stand and they don't get to make their case. Well, uh, you may have had the experience uh, where you've had an epiphany in your life, a self-realization, and you go back and you say, well, part of me always knew this. So maybe you have some personality epiphany or something, and, and but that's exactly the way we phrase it. And, and it's the way our gut tells us. We're like, part of me knew this all along. Well, that's a really interesting way to put it. And it shows some evidence for that multiplicity. But in the end, you want to see if you can experience this. Uh, and again, you can't. If you're totally tied in with the thinking mind, if you're totally tied in with language, that can never experience the multiplicity. That is cut off from genuine awareness. It is limited. It's, a, it's always going to be this kind of cloudy day between it and the sun, the origin of awareness, um, a vastness of consciousness that is aware of everything simultaneously. But to leave you with the practice, I think one of the best practices is to go into nature. And, and that may sound overly simplistic, but nature is always a multiplicity. If you go into nature, there's always so much going on and it could be very subtle. It's never really quiet in nature. And you can notice that there are parts of you that are actually simultaneously noticing all of this all at once, like a sy symphony of sorts. Except it's not putting things like we mix that up with the conductor. This is different. This is multiplicity aware of everything going on all at once. And I'll leave um, a short clip from Kung Fu, one of my favorite uh, TV series from the 70s. And it's uh, when the student comes to the teacher, and it's really about what awareness is. The student asks the teacher, um, well, I'll just cut to the end. And so the, um, uh, the teacher is trying to assess whether the student can pay attention to everything. And, and the student is like, well, you know, I can pay attention to the sound of this. And then it shifts over, just like we talk, one word at a time, one thing at a time. And so the student's awareness was limited to his thinking. And the teacher, who's blind, says, well, do you, can you hear the um, grasshopper at your feet? And the, the student says, how is it, old man, that you can notice these things or you're aware of these things when I'm not? And the teacher has a perfect reply. He says, you know, young man, how is it that you're not aware of these? And so I think it points to our original state is total awareness encompassing the multiplicity. In fact, there's evidence that we were born uh, with synesthesia. And that's a, a mixture when all the senses become blended. And so speech and, uh, well, sounds and vision and touch, they all become intertwined into one experience. And that's a good example of being aware of all things at once. And then that pruning process took place where all these cells um, died off, leaving uh, the senses separate and isolated. And that's why now, so that tied in with the thinking process because you know we focus on vision or audition or touch, and now we really focus on one sense at a time or one thought at a time. So uh, you know that's the question: How is it that you don't hear all everything and see everything and notice everything all at once? Because that is awareness.